The other day I was talking to a buddy of mine, Jeff Braun, who is one of the top five country mixers right now in the world, super in demand, just absolutely crushing tons and tons of charts, phenomenally talented. And I was asking Jeff, I was like, you ever run into a situation where a producer comes to you, you mix a song for them, and then they come back and they're like, hey, the mix is really great. Can you make it sound exactly like my reference, but just a little bit better? Or the opposite scenario where the producer comes in with the reference mix, you kind of match the reference mix, you big it up by like 10 or 15%. And the producer's like, yeah, this is cool. It's a little bit too close to the reference mix. Can you just, you know, do your thing with it? And we kind of went down that rabbit hole for a while and it got us thinking and I realized there's a cool video topic in here and something I want to talk about and something I feel like you're not going to hear a lot of people talk about. And that is what people think mixing is, isn't always what mixing is. So let me kind of take you behind the scenes of what it's like to work on major production. Last year, I did a little rant video here like this one where I was talking about how it may not be the mixer's fault when they screw up your favorite record, right? Where you go in you hear a mix and you're like, oh, this mix is terrible. I can't believe they ruined my favorite band. And then my argument was, look, and for a number of reasons, you can go watch the video, but essentially that the mixer doesn't always have control over the mix. And sometimes the decisions that get made are not necessarily the mixer's fault, but that of the artist, the producer, and them wanting to do a certain direction. And the mixer is kind of painted into the corner and kind of just gets to enhance it. So this brings up an interesting point here in reference to what we're talking about is that as a mixer and somebody who does this professionally, you're going to get a wide spectrum of different types of things. And it's very difficult because you kind of have to make a decision ultimately on what you want to do. And that spectrum is as follows. So on one side of the spectrum, you have a scenario where you have an artist or a band and a producer and they're working on some music and maybe they can't quite get the sounds that they want to. For example, this happens in metal all the time where they're like, I can't get the guitar tone I want to. I can't get the drum sound I want to. I can't get the bass tone. I'm just going to send the mixer a bunch of MIDI and DIs and say, figure it out. And you'll get handed certain things where you kind of basically have to play producer, which has always been a little bit weird to me and something I really, really don't like as a mixer. But regardless, you're going to run into situations where that happens on one extreme. And then all the way to other situations where a producer or artist will ha essentially have a reference mix that's so good and they've done such a good job on it where they literally hand it off to a mixer because they've got it to like a solid A minus or maybe even an A, but they want it to be an A plus. And the mixer's job is to just add 10% and not change anything. This is a really interesting challenge for you as a mixer because you're sitting down sometimes and you might talk to the artist, be like, okay, what do you want? I listened to your reference mix. How married to this mix are you? And they might just be like, well, I want this. And then you send them the mix back and what happens? And they're like, well, now that we hear it, actually, could you do this instead? And that sucks sometimes because you essentially need to restart. So what does that mean? Diving into the spectrum here more, usually I find like the bigger producers, meaning people that crush charts and put up just, you know, they, they write stuff that absolutely hits very, very large audiences, tend to be much better mixers than per perhaps people that are self-producing or, you know, doing things kind of at like a lower level. It's always interesting when you're mixing bigger bands and bigger artists, you don't really always get to be yourself as a mixer, meaning a producer might come to you and say, hey, look, we want this sound, like the reference is amazing, just big it up. And it's kind of like you're, you're handcuffed. And if you go too far off reference, what happens is you run into a situation where they're just like, yeah, this is cool, but just do this. And it's always interesting because what I always thought being a mixer was, is, you know, you kind of like somebody hands you some files, you get to do your own thing with it. Like you put your flavor on at 100%, you go and you really try to do your own interpretation of a song. But Actually, instead, what I found as I've gone up and up and worked on bigger, bigger artists is that sometimes that's not true at all. You're just taking somebody's A minus or A and turning it into an A plus because they already know exactly what they want. So I think it's an important thing for you to understand. If you're aspiring to be a mixer is that you don't always get to be the mixer that you want to be, but you have to become the mixer that somebody else wants you to be. Because again, this isn't your art. It may be your mix, but it's the artist and what's what the artist wants. And I can't tell you how many times I've worked on a production where I've sent back what I think is a sick mix. And, you know, everybody's been like, this is great, but can you make it sound just like the reference? Because we want to sound like that. And you're like, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting. So that's something that happens more often than not. Now, the cool thing about that is as a mixer, it's not the hardest thing in the world to mix. You kind of just take somebody else's work and kind of big it up a little bit. 
It's much more challenging, I think, on the other side where the production decisions haven't been totally made and they get deferred to you as a mixer and you accept it. So let's explore that for a little bit. If you're mixing a lot of things that are self-produced or you're working with producers that aren't massively established or don't have massive experience, you're gonna find they usually get into a situation where they can't quite nail the sound that they want. So they're like, oh, we can't get it on a production level. So let's just hire this really awesome mixer that we like that's done this and this and this record. And to give them some reference, like we want the guitars of this and the drum sound of this and that and that, and they kind of mash it all together and see if they can pull it off. And I feel like this happens so often and I've probably mixed a thousand songs, no exaggeration in my career, that have come in under that template. Especially doing metal productions, you will find more often than not that people will turn in guitar DIs, they will turn in MIDI, they will turn in MIDI bass and vocals, and then be like, here you go, mix this song, and you're like, whoa, hold on a second. You know, it's like, what do you do? You have to reamp, you have to guess what the band wants, and then you mix it, and you send it back to them, and it's always like, it's maddening. So like anything, you go in, you do your absolute best with it, you send it back to the band and you hope that they don't hate it. And usually they'll be stoked at it if you've done a good job. So that's kind of the spectrum and the continuum that you're gonna get as a mixer and the challenge of it. Now this leads me to the next thing I wanna talk about in regards to this, which is what I call the chase. The chase is when something is hot and everybody and their mom wants to copy that sound and wants to go after it. So let me tell you a story, for example. Let's rewind a decade. I used to do a lot of mixing with my good friend, Joey Sturgis, who was one of the most in-demand metal producers in the world for a very, very long time. Joey was incredible and brilliant. And we did so many songs. One time I did 67 songs in a single month with him as a mixer, which was insane. We were cranking like an average of 40 plus songs a month. It was nuts. And the thing is, is like Joey had some bands that blew up and a whole genre came up around him and his sound and his style. Everybody wanted it. And there was an endless amount of artists that wanted to copy that sound because that was a thing. And it was interesting because I would sit there with Joey and we'd be like, hey, let's change it up a little bit. Let's change the sound. Let's graduate it. Let's evolve it. And then we would try it on a band and they would come in and they'd be like, yeah, this is cool. Can you make it sound exactly like X, Y, and Z? And we'd be like, oh, all right. Back to the same drum samples, the same guitar tone, the same everything. And then, you know, we would try it again and then they kept coming back. So it's very interesting to me when something blows up or a mixer, for example, blows up and a certain sound becomes really, really popular is that everybody wants to chase that sound. Now, the weird thing about it is that while everybody wants to chase that sound, there's usually only like one or two people in the world that can do that sound and no one can really afford them except for the top bands. But you get all these people that are like trying to imitate and emulate that sound. And what they'll do is they'll try to find somebody else and say, okay, can you make it sound like X right now? Can you make it sound like Y? And that's a really, really weird position to be put in as a mixer where it's like, hey, I can't afford this person right now because they're too in demand, but you can do something similar. So can you copy that person's sound and make a sound as close to that as possible but we don't wanna pay you that much because we only have half rate or a quarter rate. And it really gets me thinking like, why do we do this as people? You know, like why do we sit down and do we chase somebody else's sound and we try not to find the sound of the band, but we try to find the sound of the mixer of the day or the flavor of the day. And we're just blindly chasing that. Cause what happens is all of a sudden now you have, let's say 500 to a thousand bands in a genre, all emulating the same sound and doing different level versions of it. And everything sounds the same and it gets boring and then people get tired of listening to it and then they move on and they go find something else and then hopefully somebody comes out with something new and then everybody chases that. I mean, this is just human history and psychology. This happens again and again and again and again and again in music. And it kind of makes me think from like a professional standpoint, like I wish this didn't happen but on one side of you, you're like, well, I got a family to feed and I got kids and I got to work really hard and I got to mix a lot of songs to make the money that I need to buy all the gear I need and pay the bills and all that stuff. So one side of the spectrum is like, all right, well, just do work and go out and try to kill it and be competitive. And the other side is the artistic one where it's like, wow, it'd be really cool if like, I could just sit down with a band and try to find their sound and wasn't trying to be forced to be somebody else or to copy some producer's mix and just get, you know, that would be cool. But again, there's reality versus art and somewhere in between. And depending what you're dealing with and what day and what type of artist on that type of mixing spectrum, like I was talking about earlier, you're going to be stuck in one of those boxes and you're going to have to play by the rules if you want to essentially make a living doing this. So I think the major takeaway is here to be more successful professionally when you're mixing and working with clients is to sit down 
and to figure out where on that spectrum you need to play on any given mix. Now, how do you do that? You get on the phone with the artist or the manager or the producer, the A&R, whoever you need to get everybody on the same page and figure out exactly what it is that they want to sound like so you can figure out, do I get to be me today or do I get to be what they want me to be today or somewhere in between? Because when you can get really, really clear communication from the artist and the producer, you have a much better shot of giving them what they want the first time and making them happy. And then hey, if you give them what they want, guess what? And they enjoy working with you, they will come back to you. So that's a little insight on what it's like to do this professionally and some of the things that happen that you may or may not have control over, that you may or may not like, but it's just the reality of the world that we live in here in mixing. If you like this type of comment, drop me a like and a comment below. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hit the notification bell and please subscribe to this channel. I like to talk about all types of different topics here that a lot of people don't talk about. So thank you so much for watching. And of course, if you want to learn how to mix, check out Nail the Mix.